Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of getting together. With freedom, we're able to walk into this building and study the Bible together and pray together and encourage one another in the faith. And we are just so grateful for our country and the freedoms that we have had and in many respects continue to have today. We pray your blessing upon our time together. Grant your mercy upon the sharing and hearing of your truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to turn to the Gospel of John. And I have three passages to which I will turn. <clears throat> From chapter 7 and 8. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to talk to you about heart change and God's word. A change of heart, a new heart, and God's word, the Bible. And I think you'll see as we walk through these passages together <clears throat> um, how this comes out. And we'll give a little brief context and state the main point. And then give some three truisms and follow that with an application of the truth to our lives, yours and mine. Chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, one verse only, verse 17. <clears throat> John 7, 17 reads, if, anyone, if anyone's will is to do God's will. He will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The debate in this chapter was, who is this rabbi? Where did he get his teaching? And by what authority is he teaching? We, we don't have any certificate of graduation from a local rabbi seminary. And we don't have any um, religious source of affirmation about him so how how is he teaching like this <clears throat> and jesus says in the midst of that well i'll tell you what if you want to do god's will you'll accept my teaching as truth it's an important point chapter eight <clears throat> two sections here <clears throat> Verses 31 and 32, followed by verses 42 through 47. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So there were some who believed in him, in his teaching. And Jesus said to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 32. Oh, I read verse 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 42 of the same chapter. Pick it up there. Run through verse 47. Now, this, this portion of it is when things got heated. The Jewish leaders, um, they didn't like what Jesus was teaching. And at first they thought to manipulate him, to use him. And when he wouldn't play ball with them, Jesus is his own man. He only cared about one thing. What did the father want him to do? And that's all he cared about. Then they opposed him to his face publicly. And uh, said all manner of evil things about him. And it's in that context of heated discussion that Jesus said to them, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he, the father, sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. 
you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. I don't know of another passage where Jesus is more direct than this one. Verse 45. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is you're not of God. Now, remember, he's talking to biblical scholars. They have all the training in Old Testament exegesis and doctrine and theological thought. And he says, you have a problem. You're not saved. <laughs> I'll never forget Dr. Huber Drumright. And the gospel of John in seminary and class would say to us, boys, he said, uh, and by the way, Ed, he was from Arkansas. And he had a nasal twang that indicated it. He said, preacher boys, he said, you ought to get saved. It'll help you preach it. I'll never forget him saying that. He was making a point. He was making a point. Everybody's trying to figure out in this, these texts, who is Jesus? And where did he get such teaching? And how is it that he teaches in such contrast to the Jewish leaders? And why is it that those who know the Old Testament well oppose him and do not believe in what he is saying? And Jesus makes this point repeatedly. Here's the main point. To understand the word of God, to believe the word of God, to receive the word of God, and to live by the word of God requires that you first know God. By the way, that's why we do not believe the Bible should be taught in a secular environment. Because if you have a pagan professor teaching the Bible, he doesn't know God, you can't get the Bible right. It's more than literature. This is the word of God. Now, there are three truisms or assertions that, that Jesus makes here in this point. And I want to share those with you, and then we'll try to think together about the application of these truisms. Three, number one, God's revelation requires and expects understanding, belief, and application. I'm going to re-say that. God's revelation. What do I mean when I say God's revelation? I mean the Bible, don't I? Right? God revealed the word. The word of God is the revelation of God, of himself, of, the, of, of what we are, what sin is, what salvation is. All of that is found in the Bible, which is God's revelation to us. God's revelation requires and expects that we understand it that we believe it, and that we apply it. Now, by the way, I'm really looking forward to our next Founders Midwest Conference next February, Lord willing. And the conference theme is going to be on the perspicuity of Scripture. Now, you get an extra 10 points if you know what the word perspicuity means. So most all of you perhaps know. It's the understandability of the word of God. God doesn't reveal his word and then hide his truths like an egg hunt, like an Easter egg hunt. 
He wants you to understand it. It doesn't mean that you don't have to work at Bible study and, and work at interpreting. It doesn't mean that. But he's not shrouding his main truths in the shadows of complexity. But he's actually revealing. The word revelation is revealing. He is unveiling these glorious truths in a clear fashion to those who will read carefully and prayerfully his, his word. My point in point one, the first truism, is God has given that revelation so we would understand, so we would believe, and so we would apply his truth. Now, I think that's fundamental. And I think not to believe that is to miss a major aspect of the nature of Scripture itself. My goal as a pastor, in one respect, is to have all of you so trained in Scripture that you could pick up and teach others the Word of God and get it pretty much right. Pretty much right. Number two, that, that's the first truism. Second truism in what Jesus is saying here is that understanding, believing, and application of God's word all depend on each other sequentially. So you use these three words, understanding, belief, and application. They go together. You can't have one without the other. But they go together sequentially. For example, belief requires understanding right? You have to understand before you believe. To, to believe what God says is not a leap into the dark. It's a leap into the light. The word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And so the word speaks and we understand and, and thus we believe what we understand. However, understanding that leads to belief also involves what? Application. It's not just understand it and believe it, but do something about it. Put it into practice. That's where we come to obedience. And James chapter 1 comes to mind. He makes strong statements about not just hearing the word, but doing the word. But doing the word requires hearing the word, doesn't it? So you have understanding, which leads to belief, which leads to application. They go together and they're sequential third truism. So the first one is God's revelation requires and expects understanding, belief, and application. Two, understanding, belief, and application depend on each other sequentially, linked together sequentially. And number three, and really is the heart of the point, all three of these things as it relates to God's word, the Bible, all rest upon a changed heart a regenerate heart now you know what i mean by that i hope you must be born again jesus said in john 3 right so we have to have a different heart our understanding of god's word our belief about god's word and our application of god's word all rest upon us being spiritually saved first now someone may say by the way that's what jesus meant in john 7 17 <laughs> if you don't if you don't want to believe me it's because you don't want to do god's will if you want to do god's will you will understand my teaching that's the point in chapter 7 verse 17 and in chapter 8 he says look you don't believe what i'm saying because you don't belong to me you don't belong to the father you don't love God. If you loved God, you'd love me. You don't love me. You don't love God. He'll go on to say in another passage in the gospel of John, John 10, the great shepherd passage, my sheep, what? Hear my voice. They want to hear from me. They want to understand what I want them to know. And they yearn for the be to be fed by the word of God. All of that means this. You cannot come to the scripture and get understanding and belief and thus apply it correctly until you first come to salvation in Jesus Christ. 
That's very, very important. So how do we apply these things? Let me mention four applications that I think strike right at the heart of my life and yours and where we are today. First, this explains why some people disbelieve and why they fail to obey the word of God. Have you ever wondered why, why is it that people just don't believe the clear statement of Scripture? If you've ever had this experience where you're reading some, a passage to somebody and it's obvious what the passage is saying, and to you it's clear as a bell and they just can't get it. Have you ever had that experience? Or perhaps you've been explaining a passage and people just... The scripture says you first need a new heart to understand God's word. You need a new heart to even want to understand God's word. Until you're saved, you don't even care what God says. And I think it's remarkably um, simplistic would be a, a, a word that I'll use. I had other, maybe another word in mind, but let's just use simplistic. For Arminianism to say, well, people are wanting to be saved. All we need to do is preach it to them because they just want to be saved. And the Bible says the problem is they don't want to be saved. They run from God, not to God. They reject God. They reject his word. Well, then the, how is it anybody gets saved? Thank you for asking the question. That's where the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes in, isn't it? The Holy Spirit comes upon us and turns our hearts and regenerates our souls. And we become eager yearners for truth. I love the way Thomas Watson put it. I know I've quoted this in the last weeks, uh, but I like it so much. I don't care that you've heard it before. He said, the preacher knocks on the door, but it's the Holy Spirit that turns the key and opens the door. Isn't that beautiful? That's exactly right. And until the Holy Spirit turns the key and unlocks the door and opens the door, the door will not be opened. This explains why people disbelieve. Second, this explains Christian hunger for the Word of God. By the way, one of the, one of the benefits of preaching hard the Bible in, a, in the pulpit, week after week, month after month, year after year, is that it does two things. It drives some people away. And two, it brings some people in. And the end result is the church is purer and cleaner and stronger. People who want the word come, they, they hear their Savior's voice in the word of God, and they want it. How is it that they were changed from a, a disbeliever to a believer, to a doubter, to one who understands? This is the evidence of the saving grace of God. And it's wonderful to get together with brothers and sisters in Christ and together to feed on the word of God. Third, let's be honest. This teaching of Jesus, the Bible, challenges those who would profess Christ without obeying Christ. Jesus Christ is not just after professors, those who profess Christ. Now, we do profess Christ. Don't get me wrong. We confess Christ in our baptism. Why are we baptized? Because we've come to believe in Christ. We're believers, and we confess that in our baptism. But we don't go back and live our own lives, our own way, doing our own thing, and we don't care what God says. No. We now long to, to grow in our faith. We want to be Christians that honor the Lord, serve the Lord, right? Follow Christ. 
And I think the church, the Lord is doing some remarkable things in churches today in our cultural and societal context. But I'm absolutely convinced what he is doing is he's reducing the size of the visible church to what the church really is. Not that there's ever a, a, a direct correlation between what we see and what spiritually truly is. But I think, I think we had so many unsaved people in our churches. And, and what we're going through is, going to, is just going to take that chaff away and leave the genuine and the authentic and the real, which I think is a good thing. And one final application, and then I'll have a strong pastoral suggestion in conclusion. Um, this teaching establishes the foundation for the Christian life. This is what the Christian life is all about. You come to know Christ as your Savior and Lord, then what do you do? You get in the Word. You get in the Word. You grow. You study. You learn. You pray over the text. You try to live by the Word of God. Right? Don't we? I trust we do. This is the Christian life. It, it can't be made, said to be just this, but this is the foundation. This establishes the foundation for the rest of your Christian life experience. It's coming to understand God's word and living it out in your life, following your Savior, having heard his word. I, I need to just press hard this point as, as I make a suggestion. You, you cannot be a stronger Christian than your willingness to live in the light of Scripture. You cannot be a strong Christian without a, a, an effort on my part and yours to live in the light of the Scripture. The Word of God is vital to your soul's health. And... I heartily recommend you read your Bible regularly. I'm not saying there's any perfect uh, reading plan. What it, any plan is better than no plan at all. Just get a plan and read it. If you want to read the New Testament in a year, read Old Testament in a year. Read an old one, then a, a book, and then a New Testament book. Or read the Psalms twice and the New Testament. Just read it. Just read it. My suggestion to you is soak yourself in Scripture and learn it. Not just parts that you like, but learn the meta narrative of the whole counsel of God and try to accommodate your life to the teaching of Scripture. That reflects a heart that belongs to God and longs to see His glory. Well, let's pray for one another as we try to do this well heavenly father we thank you tonight for your word oh how we long to read it study it understand it better and we will continue to pursue it and seek your favor and guidance and enablement to understand it bless this church in its bible preaching and Bible teaching ministry. And we pray that you would ground us in the truth and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.